Chaos has signed in. Yeah, okay. Brian. I'm going to go ahead and start. Good afternoon. Oh, Welcome to GAR. Um, before I do any introductions or anything, even at the remote places, make sure you have signed the sign in sheet, not just printed your name. We need a signature and we need your license number so that we know you're there for CE purposes if you're there the entire three hours. We also need to know that so that we can get you the professional standards committee requirements that you need to be in the training. So we, even if you say, oh, I don't need CE, we need your signature. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Amy Asher with the Professional Development Department. Chrissy Campbell's in back, and she's the Director of Professional Development. And actually, Michael Young is in, I don't know, communications, and I don't know the formal title, but he's videotaping because this will be on our website. A couple house cleaning things. The very last page of your handout is an evaluation form at the end of the class if you will bubble in it's read like most of us here remember the iowa test the itbs the scantrons we need you to bubble in not x we would really appreciate how for that that's for the video conferencing sites too the last page of the of uh, the handout is the evaluation um, also if you are um, at a remote location, please be sure to um, mute until you're ready to talk and then you can unmute and kind of wave your hand. We're all trying to keep an eye on you in case there are questions and so forth. Um, the class does go until four. You need to be here the entire time to get your TV. That includes at the remote locations. Video conference attendees, please realize you need to act as if you were here at GAR. This is considered a live class in order to be a live class. As someone at the commission once said to me, butts in the seat. So you need to be at the class the entire three hours with the break at 15 minutes. And we'll take a break an hour and a half in, we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back together and complete for the day. Um, I think that's about it for house cleaning for now. I do want to introduce today Christina Chow will be our instructor. She is the Director of Legal Affairs for GAR. She is the Committee Liaison for Professional Standards, Legal Action, Insurance Trustees, and the Forums Committee. So you've probably seen her name around. Working with Christina, she'll introduce you in a minute to Lily, is also in the department, and I'll let you do those introductions. Christina is a lawyer, so she is great at the legal positions and understanding the nuances, so she's a great resource. Went to UVA, University of Virginia, uh, for a psychology degree, and then combined that with getting a law degree from the University of Georgia, go dogs. So I'm going to move out of your way. Welcome, enjoy the class. Hey guys, so I just want to check in to make sure that you guys in video land are good to go. If you guys can just give a thumbs up or a nod, a wave, that you guys can hear me. Good? All right. Um, so as Amy said, I am Christina Chow. I'm Director of Legal Affairs. I, um, before was JR's uh, only professional standards administrator. And now we have been very fortunate enough to hire Ms. Lloyd Plain. She is also an attorney. So GAR has now been blessed with, or maybe not, <laughs> with two attorneys. <laughs> so um, I'll be doing this training, and I will still be heavily involved with professional standards from a training kind of um, educational standpoint. Lily will kind of be more of our boots on the ground administrator, who you'll probably hear more from regarding, you know, grievance panel, professional standards panels, et cetera. So, if you ever need to reach the professional standards department, Lily, that's who. <laughs> um, anything else you wanted to add or anything? No, no, okay. that's perfect. Awesome. Um, I know that, so as we get into the first of this training, um, you guys have your handouts. You should be able to, just about everything we have on the slides, I'll probably add kind of notes as they kind of come up. You guys have all the notes in front of you though as well. Um, same thing in video land. Um, the purpose of this training is so that everyone um, in this process can understand their role. Um, but more importantly, well not necessarily more importantly, but 
as important as understanding your role, I think is understanding the other roles in which maybe you don't participate volunteer. So as a grievance panelist, you want to understand, you know, if you're going to push a complaint forward, you know, what your role is and, you know, what you're pushing forward in the role of the hearing panel. If you're someone on the hearing panel, a lot of times you may just get a complaint and you may say, how did this even end up in front of us? Like, I don't get it. We have all this documentation. Why is it here? But it's important to understand that the grievance panel only has a complaint and that they only review it on the face of the complaint and that they didn't have the luxury of reviewing a response. And so it's important to kind of understand how all of these different pieces and all the different roles work in the professional standards process. So uh, participants take this training at least once per year. I know I see some of you guys every single year because I just don't think that, oh, go ahead, please. The Association cannot hear us. So. And either can um, yeah. another
panel's appointments. If you, if you're a broker, you have any agents who want to get involved, a lot of times they'll reach out to myself or Lily and say, you know, I really want to get involved with the, I want to sit on hearings, I want to sit on panels. Um, because this is not a GAR responsibility, we do it, like I said, on behalf of, all our appointments must come from the local boards, and every local board has a slightly different process for appointments. Some of them the president gets to appoint, some of them it's a board of director decision, some of them the CEO is able to appoint anyone who's interested. Um, and some panel, some local boards may have different qualifications that they prefer for their appointments versus others. So whenever someone comes to me or if someone comes to you, your first inclination may be to direct them to myself or Lily, but actually if they want to serve on these panels, definitely direct them to the local board and then the local board will give us their names and we'll make sure that they get into these trainings. This training is recorded as we said earlier so that uh, for those who couldn't attend today, we are posting to get online and they can watch this, they'll have questions to answer and that will suffice as their training. Um, the professional standards administrator role. So the professional standards administrator is myself and Lily. And we're here to kind of, we're here to answer the calls, we send out the paperwork, we arrange the grievance panel meetings, we make sure all the paperwork is sent between the parties, we schedule and coordinate hearings, which when you show up, it's, it, when everyone shows up, it's great on the day of, but every now and then, you, and for those of you guys who have served on panels before, who have been doing this for many years, know that you will have a hearing set, you'll have a date set, and then you'll get an email from us, maybe even like as quickly as two days later, saying, just kidding, gotta reschedule, someone was unavailable. And when you're scheduling between three to five panelists, the administrator, also we have to make sure we have room availability. Like, you know, if we need to go to the local board, we have to check with their schedules. We, you know, don't necessarily, if we don't have to have, have competing meetings going on, we need room space. Witnesses, if um, the respondent wants to bring their broker, you know, the broker has a right to be part of these processes. So there's a lot of schedules to coordinate. And it's, once, when, like I said, when everyone shows up, it seems seamless and fine, but sometimes getting there can be a little bit tedious. You may be getting lots of emails from us that say yes, no, just kidding, try again. <laughs> um, and then we also set out the decisions. Um, we help the panel put their decision and their findings into a decision form, a draft form. But at the end of the day, it's your signatures that go on it. We are just in charge for communication with the parties. We don't ever put our parties in, communi in communication with our panelists. Everything needs to come through us. But we do help draft and send those out. When we draft it, it is your signatures. And I will always blame the panel when someone's unhappy. So, but it's like the outcome, it's never my fault, it's never Louis' fault, the panel made a decision. <laughs> um, and part of our process, part of our responsibility is also making sure that you guys, as volunteers, are properly prepped and trained and prepared. Because at the end of the day, part of a here an impartial, fair, unbiased panel that a respondent and a complainant is um, entitled to when they have a hearing is that everyone is adequately prepared. And when someone isn't prepared, prepared or they don't know their role and they're not properly trained, that's a basis for appeal. And if something does happen on appeal and the procedure of a hearing is not correct, that essentially negates the entire hearing. So it's our role to make sure that you guys, you guys are volunteering your time and we appreciate that and we know that you guys take the code of ethics very seriously. So it's our, well, we do our best to make sure that you guys have all the tools to be as prepared and trained for this position as possible. So that kind of leads then, what is your role? If we're doing all of this, what do you guys have to do? You guys have to be prepared. We're going to send you out documents. For those of you guys who have served with us before and are taking this as a reappointment training, or taking this as a refresher course, you guys know that we send out grievance panel materials ahead of time, usually about 48 to 72 hours ahead of time. If the grievance panel has more than you know, maybe three or four cases, we might even send it out you know, five days ahead of time. There's a lot of materials sometimes, and we always want you guys to be as prepared. We will always give you that material ahead of time. It's also to understand your role within the process. A grievance panelist shouldn't be finding someone in violation of the code because that's the grievance panel. We don't have a response. We're not at a hearing. Um, if you're a hearing panelist, your role is to be impartial. It's not to interrogate and make one of the parties feel as though you are siding with them. It's your job to be um, impartial, unbiased. It's to understand the code. Um, 
presumably speaking, I would make the assumption that most of you guys are very familiar with our code of ethics, um, that you guys adhere to the code, that you guys respect the code, um, otherwise you guys would not be here. Um, it's also to ask questions when things are unclear. If things seem wrong, if things don't make sense, it's to ask questions. We do our best to prep you all, to provide you guys with as many answers upfront as possible. But there's gonna be questions that maybe we don't realize that you have. There's gonna be things that maybe you notice as a panelist that we didn't think were really an issue. And it's important that you guys ask these questions so that they don't lead to things that maybe would be procedural issues down the road. To be fair and impartial, to respect this process, which I know that all of you guys do, this is why you guys have volunteered to be involved in this. And to understand that the code of ethics it was, is what sets apart realtors from the rest of licensees. So this process is something that we provide to other agents, whether or not they're licensees or not members of the public, as a resource to say, hey, one of your members we feel is not acting to the standards that you require of them. And this is what our process is for. So we are going to do um, some code of ethics just to make, making the assumption that everyone's familiar with the code of ethics, but we're about to find out. So we have um, kind of a polling exercise. Like everyone in video land should also be able to participate. Um, the number should be in your materials as well. So if you want to, if for whatever reason, you guys don't copy down this number. And then we're gonna do the first question, just kind of um, a test question to make sure. So the, I use the number still at the top of the board says vote by texting. Oh, I need to reset. Oh yeah, so hard, hold on a second. I need to. Raising their hand and bell down. Do you want to admit it? I just want to make sure. Hi, Bell Dasta. Do you have a question? Uh, no, I was just trying to see myself on the TV. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone's, it seems to be working. So the next question is going to be 
Right, and these are, this should be the next page of all the list of questions for you guys. Um, so you can see those there. And this is going to be, uh, realtors must always compensate other brokers for their cooperation and transactions. One for true, two for false.
I believe license law says that if you are going to sell property in which you have an interest, you still need the permission of your broker. So just because you're doing these things, guys, also keep in mind that there's also other things that you need other entities, rules and rights that you may need to be keeping in mind, such as your broker's policies, license law, et cetera. Okay. So next question. Realtors agree to arbitrate financial disagreements with other brokers and their customers. Reliance on it, 
and you know, keeping in mind that the code of ethics does not have to rise to the level of something being illegal or not kind of conform to the law. Um, rules are knowledgeable and competent in the fields of practice in which they engage or they obtain, assist, uh, obtain assistance from a knowledgeable professional or they disclose to find any lack of expertise. Video land, having to um, able to kind of send their their answers in as well. You guys are good. All right. Okay, so I think that you guys know this. This is um, Article 11 of the competency. This is true. Um, and to kind of go back, I um, wanted to kind of point out. So our big articles that we're going to see, and I'll try and remember to point them out as we go through this. The big ones our panel sees a lot, or that get a lot, are going to be Article One. Article One. A lot of times it's always a catch-all, you know, treating all parties honestly and putting your client's best interests first. So if your client is, if your former client is filing against you, they're alleging most likely that you, for some reason, didn't put their interests first. Whether or not that's true is for the hearing panel, but that gets alleged a lot. Um, Article 9 as well gets alleged a lot. Um, Article 9, one that we just did about the providing the agreements when they are signed or initial. I think, and you know, you guys know better than I because you guys are the ones doing business every day. I think that with the use of you know, the dot loops, the transa these transaction management desks where everyone signs and it gets shot out at one time. And I I think we're seeing a little bit less of that kind of Article 9 vi um, violation because once it's executed, the system sends it out, I think, to everyone. Um, however, there are, you know, there are instances where you are maybe still sending things via email. You're signing and scanning. Maybe not as often, and, we, and it's, there's instances we're not doing it as often that you actually need to keep that in mind, that you don't forget to send something that you're so used to it automatically being sent. So if someone has to ask you, oh, I didn't get my listing agreement, you know, I signed it three weeks ago, while they may not file a complaint, chances are if a complaint gets filed, even if you provide it when they ask for it, you're probably you're looking at a potential violation, a very strong likelihood of a violation. So that's just to kind of keep in mind, Article 9 does get alleged quite frequently because someone says, well, I asked for it, and you know, I didn't get it, or I had to ask for it a couple weeks later, so I didn't get it when I signed it. If you send it via email, and then a week or so later, the seller says, no, I want you to send it snail mail, <coughs> With me sending an email, does that that's even though it's not the way that he wanted it sent. So the question was, if, and it's just, I, I'll try to repeat questions for this in video. And the question was, um, if you sent it via email, but then they request it via snail mail, um, I would say for the purpose, if, if that was the case, it's a complaint, um, a complaint filed against their agent. Um, I would say for the purpose of Article Nine, if you ensure that you send the executed copy when it was signed, that's fine. But if your client is also requesting it in in hard copy and you just don't do it because you don't think you need to, I could say that I would say that there's a potential depending on the rest of the facts for an article one or any other article because that was your client. If they asked for it, I think that they could make the argument potentially that it was in their best interest to have it and if you just didn't do it or you looked at it. So it may not be article nine for your failure to send it out or there may be something else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. I sent it though, so <laughs> Article 11, so this is the one about competency, to come back to this question. I have been noticing in the last year and a half, two years, a lot of Article 11s in regards to property management. Guys who are brokers or agents, please know what you're doing in property management. There are a lot of things that are just kind of happening. I don't know what, a lot of my hearings recently in the last year and a half, two years have been Article 11, they just did not handle security deposits correctly, they didn't do walkthroughs, they didn't, they didn't handle something in this, you know, and we all know that the commission has very specific timelines and rules and rights for property management, and Article 11 is very regularly cited with property management ethics uh, complaints. A realtor may advertise in any way that helps him or her promote the sale of property.
think that you guys all know that obviously that's not true. All of your um, real estate communications need to be honest and truthful. Um, you can't just say whatever you would like um, or do whatever you would like when it comes to advertising. There are, like I said, and a lot of these things will coincide kind of, um, with other you know, states' license law requirements, including Georgia. So this, I mean, obviously, as you guys know, commission rules are right. You can't just advertise however you want. There are odds um, in place. Realtors willingly participate in ethics proceedings.
and I'm going to say, even if maybe a panel down the road disagrees with me, I'm going to say for you guys, if you have an interest, disclose it in writing. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Realtors shall not knowingly or recklessly make false or misleading statements about other real estate professionals, their businesses, or their business practices.
So this one is a little bit closer than some of the other ones, but this is actually false. Um, stop. <coughs> So this is actually going to be Article 16, which states that realtors shall not engage in any practice or take any action inconsistent with the exclusive representation or exclusive brokerage relationship that other realtors have with clients. Every person is entitled to client representation. So if someone is being, not, and it's not even represented, but if someone is working with a brokerage as a customer, they are entitled to work with a different brokerage as a client. Now, that, is, that issue is separate and apart from, you know, are there going to be potential commission issues, potential, you know, procuring cause issues down the road. That's, that's separate and apart from Article 16. But every person is entitled to client representation should they seek it. And should they be willing to pay that fee for it? A brokerage that is working with a person as a customer has no right to say that person can't get client representation. Realtors disclose any fees or financial benefits they may receive from recommending real estate related products and services.
litigation of an ongoing GREC investigation, and you guys always ask the question of us, you know, what should we do moving forward, or can we even hear this? And the answer is yes. Just because there's an ongoing GREC or civil litigation doesn't mean that we need to stay our process. Um, sometimes it's in the best interest to, um, and Lily or I, whichever administrator is working it, will review it and kind of give you our opinion, but it's ultimately up to the grievance panel if they want to stay it um, and hold it in advance. Generally speaking, and I've encouraged Lily's that our default shouldn't be just to hold everything that goes to the commission in advance. I've heard, I don't know if it's true, I've heard the commission have a backlog of several years. We don't want to be holding on to these complaints for several years if we don't need to. And a lot of times our code of ethics complaint doesn't really have any impact on whether or not they violated license law. However, if something comes to us and there and someone is saying they um, that if a broker's co-legal funds is taking earnest money, checks, and cashing them and pocketing that cash, we will most definitely be holding this in advance and we will let the commission do what they need to do because if that is the case, they may not be our real estate licensee much longer and that just, we don't even have to worry about the huge you know, ramifications of the co funds as far as the code of ethics goes. So this is, like I said, this is one of the more serious ones. We've only had a couple of the years I've been here, but it is very serious that if you are um, keeping client customers and trusted funds separate from your own. Uh, so, then that's the end of your questions on your sheet left for us. That was article eight. So, I kind of talked through the articles that come up a lot, the articles that don't come up as much, the articles that are a little bit more serious than others. Um, but there are still some tricky articles that I just want to kind of talk with you guys and make sure that you guys at the new stage as well as the professional standards here in Kale State understand the intent and purpose behind. So the first one is going to be um, Article 17. A local principal should also file an ethics complaint alleging a possible violation of Article 17 of the Code of Ethics when filing his or her arbitration request. True or false? Have I started it? Um, unauthorized access to property. 
So this is, these two standards of practices are oftentimes kind of cited together under Article 1 and 3. Um, for those of you guys who are new, I'm sure you guys learned though in your code of ethics classes, a respondent or alter can only be found in violation of the article itself and not the standards of practices. However, the standards of practices can be cited in support of a finding of a violation of the actual article. So Article 1 says, you're going to look out, you're going to put your client's best interests first, treat all parties honestly. Well, if you allow someone access to your client's property without their permission, that's not putting their interests first. So there may be a violation of Article 1 based on this finding. And then Article 3 states that you shall not provide access to listed property on terms other than those established by the owner or the listing broker. Now, an AR does, isn't redundant. Now, this is probably one of those areas until honestly probably a few months ago when I went to NAR annual training that I realized there was actually a very nuanced difference between these two standards of practices because they sound very similar. And generally when that panel says there's a violation of one, there's a violation of the other, I nod my head in agreement, type up the facts, send it off. I've been very fortunate that it hasn't been appealed. The difference is, and it's very nuanced, is that Article 1 applies to your agent. Okay, look out for your best interest. So Article of uh, Standard Practices 116 is going to apply to listing agents, that you are not going to allow others to access your client's property on terms not authorized by your clients, putting their best interests first. Article 3 tends to apply to co-oping agents, the behavior of co-oping agents. And Article of uh, Standard Practice 39 says that you are not going to give your client access to property on terms that the listing agent didn't agree to or the seller didn't agree to. So it sounds very similar, and I've, I have quite honestly allowed panels to find violations of both and using each of the best agreement, but like I said, NAR <coughs> isn't redundant, and when they're finding in this group, the difference between you. So moving forward, I will also do better. <laughs> um, so similarly to Article 17 is, when does one allege a potential Article 14 violation? In order for there to be an Article 14 violation, there has to be an indication that the respondent failed to cooperate with our process to begin with. So if you as a grievance panel uh, get a complaint that says, Article 14, they violated Article 14, they, they aren't giving me the stuff that I want. I asked for all this additional documentation because I want to file a separate lawsuit, and they aren't giving it to me. That's not an Article 14 violation. That you, there has to be an indication that you failed to participate in our process as requested, as required by your membership. Article 14 doesn't say just because I requested something of you as a complainant that I'm entitled to it. If you refuse to give it to me, then you're automatically, I think, assigned an Article 14 violation. Does that make sense? Good deal, Ann. Um, so the grievance panel, this is the first time an ethics complaint has been filed against a respondent. And Article 14 is cited, they're probably gonna, it's probably going to be dismissed. The respondent, especially if it's the first time it's been cited, doesn't even know there's a complaint yet because the respondent isn't notified of a complaint, a potential complaint, until it goes through grievance. So that's to keep in mind for the grievance panel. As well as, you know, this is also to keep in mind when you're adding articles that you don't want to just add Article 14 because someone failed to provide documentation requested that was not necessarily part of a transaction, but maybe they're trying to gather information for a an individual um, seller to buy or buy whatnot. So the code of ethics and law. So I was saying earlier, part of the code, you can just, you can do what you need to do. Just make your disclosures, get your informed consent. You can get those fees, referrals, etc. That's the code of ethics, guys. And what I want to tell you is that, and what I want to make sure you, and I'm sure most of you guys do understand, but maybe for your agents and others that you encounter is that um, even though the code says if you receive these other this other compensation and you disclose it and you're, you get the informed consent, you're good to go under the code. Well, FYI, guys, even if you get your informed consent and you make your disclosures, that doesn't mean there aren't RESPA issues. Um, you can still, um, RESPA says that you cannot receive kickback for real estate settlement services, and that's still very much the case. And quite frankly, I don't think the government's going to care when you tell them why well, follow the code. I just don't think that's going to follow. Well. Um, the big example when they asked earlier was, you know, what are some kind of examples? And the easiest one is for me to think of is, you know, I have a buyer and I tell them that they should use law firm ABC to close a transaction. And they say, and I say, you know what, if you use law firm ABC, I get a fee, I get a, they pay me a fee for referring them. 
And then say I tell them, if I tell the other side, everyone agrees to it, that's fine, I don't care if you get a fee, they're good, they close the deal for me. You've made your disclosure, you've got your consent, you still can't do it, FYI. Maybe, maybe you're not gonna get in violation because maybe someone files a complaint and you say, well, it made all this. The panel's hands may be tied because maybe there's no code of ethics complaint, but that's not gonna fly with the federal government. So, yes, Tony. Yeah, the can't do it part is if it is not disclosed on the settlement statement, right? <coughs> Correct. Okay. Correct. So that is, um, yeah, just FYI that even if you can do something, there's other things that you also need to be aware of as well. Yeah. Like that generally speaking, I follow the code, even if you did, it's not going to be a court watch to protect yourself. So now that we've kind of established, you know, we did our icebreaker, we knew that you guys were very familiar with kind of the overarching idea of each article, discuss some of the more um, difficult articles. Um, we're going to go through now the actual process and where each of you guys and each of your roles um, comes into play. So the thing that happens first is that someone, every now and then someone finds our information on the website and they're just sending it in. What happens more times than not though is someone's sending us an email about what happened. Someone's given us a phone call and says, I want to file a complaint. Excuse me. And often enough, actually, I think a lot of the complaints that we get or calls that we get actually come from not our website but our forms because our number is on the, the bottom of the forms and it says, you know, here's our number. And they're having an issue with the transaction, they're having an issue with the broker, and here's a number on this form of this, you know, they're using our form, so obviously we can do something about it, maybe. So we're going to take this call. Sometimes a person just wants to vent, and they just want to call, and they just want to vent, and they want to vent. And they want to vent some <laughs> And we let them. And sometimes it's all it takes. Sometimes it's a, I understand. I can see why you're upset. You have every right to be upset. Yes, I understand. And that's all they need to hear. Like someone who's listened to them and then they're ready to move on. Sometimes if they want to file the complaint, or maybe they want to see if there's something they can work out, because they don't necessarily want to go through this process of filing a complaint to a hearing. <coughs> so they want to speak with a third party. And it can't be myself or Lily because we are neutral um, administrators of this process and we don't ever want to make it seem like to our member that we're taking the side of the complaining party, but we also don't want to make it seem to the complaining party that we have taken the side of our member because they have already feel many times as such. We are a realtor association, this is a realtor member, so we don't usually get too involved in kind of working out any potential issues between a complaining party and a responding party. What we do have though in place, for at least depending on the situation, is an ombudsman. I don't personally love the term an ethics um, um, a mediator of ethics. I don't necessarily like the way it sounds. But for all intents and purposes, the ombudsman is there to say, to reach out to the complaining party and say, hey, what's going on? Lily told me that you were frustrated. They, she gave me some of the facts of what happened. Why don't you tell me what happened? Sometimes the ombudsman does not need to reach out to the other side because they are able in a, in a way that I don't have the experience, and I don't necessarily want to speak for Lily, but we're not agents and brokers the way you guys are, so sometimes we're hearing things and we're not able to explain things the way that you guys are, given that you guys practice this every day professionally. Sometimes it's just a matter of explaining, you know, where the miscommunication went. This is, you know, here's what they did, and maybe that wasn't the best practice, but they didn't really, you know, here's what they were doing most likely, and sometimes that ends it. Sometimes it doesn't though, and then the ombudsman may reach out to the party who would be the subject of the complaint, who would be the one receiving the complaint. And they'll reach out and say, hey, you know, Mr. Smith got in touch with Lily and said that they're gonna file a complaint. Here's what he told me happened. He doesn't really want to, you know, he wants to try and work out if possible. Why don't you tell me your story? Sometimes that clears up the confusion. Sometimes, every now and then, it's gonna be, you know what, if I throw him, you know, 150 bucks, you know, if I throw him some money that we can't do an ethics proceedings because we're out of court of law, but if I am offering him, offer to give him, you know, a few hundred bucks to fix, you know, the light that wasn't, that was supposed to be fixed but wasn't, you know, that I said would, would get fixed, will he drop it and let it go? And that, an ombudsman can do that. An ombudsman can facilitate these conversations so that it doesn't have a complaint, an ethics complaint doesn't have to be filed. Because at the end of the day, this complaint may be filing may file this, but are they going to be really happy with the fact that the respondent may have to take an ethics class? 
you know, that's not really the outcome they're looking for. So the ombudsman's there in the right circumstances to help, if possible, resolve the dispute. And we have a, for those, it's, and it's optional. If the complaint doesn't want to do it, so, and sometimes they're really, really riled up, let me tell you. They are so riled up, and they, nothing you say besides like the realtor's title and stick will make them better. So the ombudsman process is optional, but it is offered to, in just about every circumstance. Now, it does say, like I said, it's not offered in every circumstance because going back to the Article 8 commingling of funds, I'm not going to put one of our volunteer ombudsmen in that position where they need to guide a broker on how to fix their commingling of funds issue. That is not a position that we are going to insert the association into via an ombudsman. We're going to let the complaint just be filed and take it through um, the appropriate channels. But I would never put one of our volunteer members in a position where they are now, even if nothing is illegal, even if the, the ombudsman has not done anything wrong, they're in a position where they are trying to speak with the, speak through the reason why someone's coming to the funds. And that's not okay for our ombudsman to be in that position. Um, Arbitration requests, um, we get those as well. We'll explain the mediation process, we'll explain the arbitration process. A lot of times we're gonna get the calls from the agents directly. Um, for those of you guys who uh, have never served with us, arbitrations are between realtor principals and brokers. They are not between agents because agents ultimately are not, you don't own the contracts. So any commissions that are paid are paid to the broker who then, with whatever agreement they have in place, funds are then paid to the agent. So all arbitration requests must come from the broker or the brokerage, but a lot of times we're gonna be speaking with the agent because they're the one, the broker may not have been involved in the transaction at all. Um, so the agent will call, will explain, hey, here's the way the process is gonna work. Um, you're not bringing your broker now. And if you're a broker, and unfortunately we get this a lot, but my broker doesn't wanna pursue it, if my broker doesn't wanna rock the boat, sorry about that, maybe get a new broker. I mean, that is, unfortunately, that is, you know, and, and that is, I mean, that is the reality of the situation is that this is the broker's commission. If the broker doesn't want to fight for it on your behalf, that's their right. So, we'll explain that process to them. When the complaint or request is filed, um, we're going to check, the administrator is going to check to make sure the E1 um, or A1 form is filled out correctly and accurately. Um, e for ethics, A for arbitration. Got it. So the, the E1 should never list standards of practices for the reasons why we discussed before. You're never in violation of the standards of practices. You're in violation of the article. Now in decision, you can be found in violation of the article as supported by the standard of practice. But in a complaint list standards of practices, we will send it back to them, let them know, hey, then you need to list the article, but if you would like to address the standard of practice specifically, put that in your narrative so we understand exactly what you're speaking to. Um, we check to ensure that the respondent is a realtor. Um, for the A1, we check to make sure that only the brokers and or brokerages are listed. Sometimes we'll get complaints from the agent and we'll have to like check and make sure that yes, this in fact is not, you know, someone has the authority to buy the associate, uh, bind the brokerage or the broker. Um, to keep in mind though with the A1 and broker to brokerages and arbitration in general, many, so what, a, the A1 and what the Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual says is that a realtor principal has to be named. Now, a realtor principal, as defined by NAR's Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual, includes the qualifying broker, any managing brokers, any office managers, and any um, anyone else that the broker has deemed has the authority to bind in the appropriate status by their agency. Um, that's quite frankly, especially for a lot of computer brokerages, it can be a lot of people. So when the brokerage is named in the A1, any one of those people can step in and represent the, um, can represent the brokerage. Um, now when a broker is listed, um, when a realtor principal broker is listed, the duty to arbitrate is personal. So if I am named, but I'm not necessarily, if I wasn't named, I would be the one handling this arbitration request. You know, Lil, if more brokers, Lily would be handling the arbitration request if it got filed against my brokerage, not me. But if I'm named, I still have that obligation to go through this process because the duty to arbitrate is personal. So just because, typically speaking as a broker, I wouldn't really be the one engaged in this uh, arbitration request, I would hand it off to maybe my office manager, I still have a duty to show up 
for these mediations and arbitrations. Tony? On the larger brokerage, multi-office brokerage, is the qualifying broker required to be notified? So the question was for these larger, larger brokerages, is the qualifying broker required to be notified? So the answer is we don't, and the answer is no. They are not required to be notified. What is required by the arbitration manual is that the designated realtor is to be notified. The designated realtor generally is going to be either the office man or is going to be someone pretty high up and will, and in many times is the qualifying broker, but our obligation is to, is to notify the designated realtor. And then the qualifying broker, though, by virtue of the fact that this person is a qualifying broker, obviously has the ability and you know, they take a very high interest in participating in these requests because their broker is named. But it's whoever we have listed as the designated realtor because the designated realtor is not always going to be the same as a qualifying broker. The qualifying broker may not take a role in some of these realtor processes. Oh, so you're saying GAR has a list up for every entity who that designated realtor, designated realtor. Yes. Okay. yes. So in order for a, so the question was if they are kept a list of who the designated realtor is, and for all brokerages, they have to designate a realtor, a, de a designated realtor. All Do companies have a designated realtor? Yes. And like I said, sometimes it's the qualifying broker, sometimes it's an office broker, sometimes it's a managing broker. I, yeah. And so it gets complicated when you get, have these larger companies. So the answer is, it is not by default the GREC qualifying broker who is notified. Um, scheduling agreements panel meetings. So we have, so unlike hearings, we can have regular scheduled agreements panel meetings. We schedule them usually at the end of the previous year for the following year. So for 2020, we scheduled them and set them around early December, sent them out to our potential chairs as so they knew what days to set aside because we collect, collect, we um, receive the, yeah, just get them off of me, guys. <laughs> so we receive these um, complaints and requests, and rather than having to put together a panel of five, three or five people, every time we get one, we have these meetings and then say, okay, at this meeting, we're going to review all the ones that came in between our last meeting. Unlike hearings where you know you have to actually schedule the based on party availability, you know that's it. Grand panel meetings are a little bit more kind of routine in that regard. So there's regularly scheduled meetings. They're usually every two to four weeks, depending on the time of year. The nice thing about for those who serve on grievance is that it's all via teleconference. You don't have to, you know, as a panelist, you'll never be permitted. As a hearing panelist, you'll never be permitted to participate via Zoom. However, as a grievance panelist, it's all via Zoom. So just as you guys on video land are participating today, you guys will be participating just like this. So we have a panel with someone from Atlanta, from Albany, from Camden, Charlton, Northeast Georgia, and Athens. And that and it's great. So we get lots of participation from all over the state. Um, materials are usually sent three to four days in advance. Um, every now and then, if we have just a real, I mean, people are really getting risky and like really you know, just doing whatever they're doing and we get you know five six seven complaints we need to a little bit sooner because part of as we said earlier part of your role is to be as prepared as possible and obviously you guys can't be prepared when we have seven or eight complaints if you guys are only getting a day to review it we usually have three to five panelists per meeting every so what we usually do is we'll shoot, shoot out an email usually a week before the scheduled meeting um, they're usually scheduled on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Um, when they are scheduled. Every now and then if we have just an exorbitant number of complaints, we will maybe do an impromptu meeting, kind of last minute to kind of divide some of the workload. Um, but we usually will send out, you know, an email to five, seven, eight people. And typically speaking, doing that results in maybe three to five people who say yes that they're available for the next week's meeting. Every now and then though, we get lucky and everyone's available. And so when people are available, I hate to tell, especially for groups, I hate to tell them no. So a lot of times they will still, we'll just do a bigger meeting. You know, we can do seven people. We just have to have a minimum of three people. And we try to keep it at high numbers, obviously. So during the group's panel meeting, um, you're going to be provided, and you get all of these materials in advance when you get the actual complaint or requests. You're provided a checklist. And we as the administrators do our best to check off the, the truly administrative items. You know, is the respondent a realtor? Is the U1 filled out correctly? Are only articles listed? And then a big one that we actually do not kind of mark off, if you will, as administrative, 
and has had the com complaint been filed within 180 days. And we'll kind of discuss why this is really the role of the grievance panel to make that discussion, even though it kind of seems administrative. So first of the arbitration analysis during the grievance panel meeting, uh, was the complaint filed within 180 days of closing, um, or when the realtor principal could have known about the closing with reasonable due diligence? So I don't know that we have this issue all that often. I don't know that we've ever had this issue in Georgia, but I guess in other states, the reason why they clarified this a few years ago we did, okay, was that it's, I guess there are in some states you could not report or you could hide the fact that there was a closing, so it's not public knowledge. And then brokers were waiting or whoever it was was waiting until after that 180 day time frame to file or to record whatever it may be. And then saying, well, on, 100, when, on day 182, when I somehow received notice, well, that's outside 180 days, so there you go, it's not valid. But if someone's intentionally trying to hide that there was a closing, there's no way for you to know, this is where the second part, world of principle, could have known about the closing with reasonable due diligence. And that reasonable due diligence is always left up for interpretation. And that reasonable due diligence is why this is not an administrator role to check off. So the main question to be asked with the arbitration analysis is, if the facts alleged are assumed to be, are assumed to be true, is there an arbitral issue that can be heard by our arbitration hearing panel? So, and to backtrack one step, guys, back to the time in this issue, say like no one's hiding it, no one's, you know, it closed though, on January 1st, but there's a transaction that closed on January 1st. I knew about it, I didn't get around to it, I got lazy. I don't file an arbitration request until July 4th. But I knew it. As compelling as the facts may be, as much as this other broker truly, based on the facts, just well, you know, parachuted on in and took your buyer, and as compelling as the facts may be to you as a grievance panel, it stops here if you, if there is a 180-day statute of limitations that has been passed. As, I know it can be difficult sometimes, especially in more so with ethics, when you're when you hear some of the facts that just, you know really are so compelling that it, you just feel like it needs to go to a hearing for someone to hear it. That's not the role of the grievance panel. The grievance panel needs to understand we have 180 days to actual limitations and that that's a hard and fast 180 days. Once you establish when that legal due diligence could have been, once you establish the close of that transaction. And I'm assuming the realtor saying, well, I wasn't aware there was a 180 day stipulation, that doesn't surpass. Correct. So the question was if you know the walls are getting realized about a time frame, and that is correct. You know, unfortunately, I mean, there could be instances where you don't know for a, you know a year or a year and a half that there was a 180 day statute, but we're we limited to 180 days, and that's a hard and fast 180 days. Now, if you really couldn't have known because of the the reason something was did, and you really could not have known, no matter how much reasonable due diligence you did, that's a different story. And like I said, that's why this is not an administrative issue for us to say, oh, that's more than 180 days from closing. There's other facts that you guys as a panel should consider. But if you guys do consider it and decide that it's outside of 180 days, <coughs> it should not be moving forward for any more discussion. It needs to be discussed. So the question is then, uh, if there, it's assumed to be true the facts, is there an arbitral issue? Um, other considerations for the agreements panel is, is the amount in this beat too large or too small? Is the issue too legally complex? Can an impartial hearing panel be assembled? So to this last issue, this is a no-brainer, absolutely 100%. Um, I think this question that is on the checklist that we pull from NAR and kind of modify for our uses is for those that maybe keep it at a local board level, who don't participate in statewide, who maybe have a small board, they want to handle everything themselves, but in doing so, it may be a little bit more difficult to pull in impartial um, panelists. But at, at a state level, we don't ever have that issue. Um, and then is the amount in this beat too large or too small? Every now and then you'll get a, a, a request for a few hundred bucks and a grievance panel may just see, feel like it's not worth it. It's not worth the time of our volunteers. It really wasn't even worth our time to review it. But I would caution you guys from saying that something, if it is arbitrable, from saying this is too small and not worth it because this is a member benefit to our members. You know, when we talk, when people call and ask us, well, why should I join the board? What's the point of joining a board? I tell them we have a code of ethics. I tell them I talk about advocacy, education. I talk about our forms, obviously. And then within professional standards, when they ask why they should care about professional standards, I tell them about I talk about arbitration. 
This is, what, this is the benefit of their membership with us. And even if it's a few hundred bucks and it doesn't seem like a big deal to you as a grievance panel, this may be a big deal to someone else. And so taking away that benefit, just because you think it's too small, I would caution the panel from just using that as a primary, as their primary factor for not getting something forward. Um, so the big question, going back to the first, the big question is, is it arbitrable? Well, the question is, what are what is arbitrability? Grievance panel, not all monetary disputes are going to be arbitrable. I know it's going to seem like it, and we do our best um, to make sure that we provide you know a list of what are arbitrable issues. Just because you're having a monetary dispute with another broker does not automatically in and of itself mean that it's an arbitrable issue. I think it's easy sometimes to say, here's a money dispute, they're both realtor companies, send it to arbitration, let the arbitration decide who gets, you know, decide who gets the money. That's not the way that works. So arbitrable issues are outlined by Article 17 of the Code of Ethics. I think that you guys all have the current year's Code of Ethics that we're signing the materials 2020. Nothing has changed between 2019 and 2020 with Article 17. Um, but they're limited to the following issues. First is contractual disputes between roles or principles of different firms. So you'll notice that contractual disputes as well as different firms are underlined. So if you have a contractual dispute with another broker, a different brokerage, it's always going to be arbitrable by the association if there is a contract in place. Now, it has to be different firms. What we're not going to do is step in and, and arbitrate your independent contractor agreement. There are apparently lots of team disagreements that are now popping up in place. We are not getting into the middle of that. Have fun, Mr. Broker. You can do that yourself. So those are not going to come to the arbitration. Those, those should not, for those who serve our grievance panels, make it past the grievance panel. That is not an arbitrable issue by GAR. And then the other issue, the other areas, is specific non contractual disputes as outlined by Standard of Practice 17. So these basically go to, um, this basically covers, I would say a large majority of our um, arbitration requests, procuring calls. You're not gonna have a contractual dispute with another buyer's agent. There's not gonna be a contract in place. So, but there is a procuring cause issue. So that is what two of uh, addresses under standards of practices 17 for work. So these are, so these are very specific non-contractual disputes. So as a group panel, when you're reviewing a non-contractual dispute that's a procuring cause issue, it's incumbent upon each of the participants and panelists to understand under which category of specific non-contractual disputes the arbitration falls, request falls. And it's not only actually important for the grievance panel, for those of you guys who serve on professional standards, it's also on the hearing side of it, it's also important for you guys to understand because grievance panels are gonna get, like I said, three, five, seven cases to review each a.m. And yes, Lily and I are going to do our best to keep up with it, review it, kind of give them some guidance when appropriate, but we are also dealing with the same volume, the calls, the emails, and something is going to get past us every now and then. And so as a hearing panel, you also need to be aware, has something made it past the grievance panel that was outside the 180 day um, window? Was something, is something in front of us is actually not an arbitrable issue as defined by Article 17? And if so, the grievance not the hearing panel, excuse me. The hearing panel needs to recognize and understand what those issues are because when those issues arise, the hearing panel has the ability and really should take that take that upon themselves to say, hey, Christina or Lily, I think the grievance panel missed something, I think you missed something. This doesn't seem to be an arbitrable issue. We shouldn't have a hearing. Because if there isn't something that should go before a hearing panel in the first place, it makes no sense to go through this process. Does that make sense? So yes, the grievance panel does, they, they look so hard, they have so much, so much information in for any meeting, but it's also important that the panel, the hearing panels understand the distinctions between this as well. So basically these are all gonna be basically procuring cause issues where the listing broker has compensated one agent, but the other agent is saying, hey, that, that belongs to me. I was the one who procured the sale. And so these are the different, I'm not gonna read them to you, they're, in your code, they're also in your um, packet. But these are the different, the five different issues um, from the current cause. Now, what I, I will point out to number four, um, we will get quite often agreements, or not agreements, excuse me, excuse me, request to arbitrate listing agreements. 
that is a contractual issue that you have with your seller. That is not a procuring cause issue. That's a contractual dispute when your client signs too exclusive right to sell. I don't know how that happens, to be honest. Um, with all like, the information you put into the MLS, that doesn't notify you. But if you have, if there's an agent who has two, if there's a seller who has two exclusive listing agreements signed, that's not an arbitrable issue by the association. That's not an issue that you have with the other broker. Oh, excuse me. That's an issue that you have with that seller that needs to be taken through the courts and handled that way. Now, when it's two open listing agreements, that's a different story. Because then it's the question of who's advertising procured that buyer to come to you when it's two open listing agreements. So just because, so if there's a listing agreement in front of you, and I don't know how often, I did speak with someone earlier who said that some brokers are now starting to allow more open agreement, open listing agreements. I don't know how, how common practice that is yet. But in general, agreements panel, hearing panel, if you're seeing something in front of you that involves a listing agreement and that I should have been paid this commission, not the other listing agreement, that's not an arbitrable issue by the association. That's something that that, that brokerage needs to take up with that seller. And then another kind of procuring cause issue. So I think I've touched on a, um, several of them <laughs> as far as what are disputes that are not arbitrable by GAR. Uh, disputes between an agent and his or her broker over commissions owed under an independent contractor agreement. And like I said, we can go ahead and add team equipment here. I guess from what I'm gathering from some of the calls, <coughs> team leaders will have an agreement with all of their agents on their team that still somehow fit under the, the independent contractor agreement that the team leader then has with the broker. And I'm not even going to pretend that I know how to get on to all the nuances of that. So what I'm going to say is, once again, Good luck, broker. You're dealing with it, not us. So these sorts of issues will not be um, approved by the association. And any disputes that arise, um, even after an agent leaves, that work, that arose because of them being on a team, because even if they're not, even if they're a part of a different company now, but the dispute arose because of the independent contractor agreement, because of something that happened while they were at your brokerage, we're not going to arbitrate. Um, agents between in the same brokerage. Um, disputes between two listing agents pursuant to an exclusive listing agreement. And then we've got a couple, it doesn't, we don't get too many because I think the form is very clear like what date did the transaction close. Um, but we have every now and then gotten a dis um, request for like, basically what I think the, will be classified in the court of loss damages. Well, agent B didn't do something they were supposed to do or didn't encourage their client to do something they were supposed to do and it killed the transaction. They were ready to close, but whatever this other agent allegedly did killed the transaction and now I'm out of this commission that I should have received had it closed. Well, maybe you're entitled to damages, maybe you're right, I don't know, but that's for a court to decide. We can only arbitrate disputes that have closed or if it's a lease dispute, a lease that is actually executed. So shoulda, woulda, coulda, shouldn't come to us. <laughs> so, as we mentioned in, um, for arbitration, as of April 1st, 2019, we implemented as a, uh, as part of our policies and bylaws for GAR, um, mandatory mediation. So we've had that in effect since April 1st of last year, and previously, um, mediation was an optional step that brokers, if they both agreed to, could engage in. Now, before they go to a hearing, both workers at least must attempt um, to mediate. They're not required to settle, and quite frank, I don't know that it will happen, I hope it doesn't, but in theory, if both workers are kind of very firm in their position, they can show up to the mediation, and they can say, I'm not gonna settle, and they can terminate there as well. The intent of requiring mediation, and I know that I don't like to use the word require or mandatory, no one likes to be Realtors, much like myself, don't like to be told what they have to do. So we just say this is part of our process. Before you go to a hearing panel, you have to go to mediation. Before you go to mediation, you have to file your actual request. So it's just a step in the process. You're not required to settle, but if they do settle and they have a mediation agreement, then the mediation agreement is binding by the courts. And this is why it's super important for mediations for the broker who is there, who has the authority to bind, signs the agreement because the agent doesn't have the authority to bind the 
Yes. I have a question. Who's, like, who's the mediator, and are they volunteers, or is there yeah, a cost, so the, and how does that so there is. So the question was, who are the mediators, is there a cost, how basically has it facilitated? Um, the, starting off with the easiest question first, I guess, is that there is no cost to mediate. We want our brokers to maintain healthy, relate, healthy working relationships when possible. Obviously, it's not always possible, but when possible, we want to encourage them to do that. So we do not charge for mediation. They are volunteer professional standards panelists who have been involved with our process on all the different levels, so they understand what is entailed um, through a professional standards process, whether it's arbitration, mediation, um, ethics, etc. Um, and then we bring in um, an NAR trainer every couple of years to kind of get in some new people to retrain those who have been doing it for us, but like, like this course can always use a little bit of a refresher. Um, and then, yeah, so it does have to come through us. So a party can say, well, we attempted to mediate between the two of us, it didn't work, we just want to go to a hearing. I hear you. <laughs> it's too bad, so sad. Come sign an agreement to terminate and then move on, you know. But what we were told, and the reason why we took this very seriously from NAR is that they don't they don't mandate mediation in all situations, but they have encouraged the boards that they where they can get a pass their board of directors to do so, and we were one of them. And the thought process is there we've had several mediations now this year that I don't know would have gone to mediation had it not been required, had it not, had not been a required part of the process. And not all of them are gonna settle, not all of them have settled, but several of them did. And I think that while the workers have thought in the past, well, we already tried to work it out, you know what, like, let's just go ahead and arbitrate, it's like, it's fine, we're just gonna go and let a panel decide and be done with it. And that's fine, you've never lost your right if you don't settle to arbitrate, but it's the getting in front of, just getting together, I don't know that any broker, agents, mediators, are gonna come to the table and sign the agreement to mediate and then sign an agreement to terminate the mediation, you know, back to back, because they've taken the time to be there, they're gonna discuss it, and they may or may not settle, but they're, generally speaking, I think getting to the table is half the battle in the first place. Uh, the mediation, so for those mediations that don't settle, like I said, it's not required to, the mediation is confidential. Our mediation officer cannot be caught in as a witness to any related proceedings, including arbitration hearings and ethics hearings. And then, like I said previously, the broker with the authority to bind must be in attendance. And then, we're going to take a quick, I think we're going to take our 15 minute break here, and then we'll kind of come back and talk about the ethics analysis. Yes. So, the question was after the mediation, um, what should the mediator do with their notes? And yes, the mediator, for the purposes of confidentiality, the mediator will destroy all of their notes. The only thing that stays is any agreement to mediate, as well as any agreement that was reached or any uh, termination of the mediation. So, those three documents, which are provided to the mediator, are the only documents that are kept. Everything else, any notes, should be destroyed.
in my opinion, it's probably a little bit more in depth, just given the fact that with your arbitration, you have to say you have to determine if this is an arbitrable issue. At the ethics stage, you have 17 articles to pick from and to make sure are applicable, not applicable, et cetera. So much like the 180 days for arbitration, this is also 180 days for an ethics case, which is um, after the facts constituting the matter complained of could have been known in the exercise of reasonable diligence or within 180 days after the conclusion of the transaction, whichever is later. So it came, um, came up earlier, it's like, well, what if I didn't know about something until two years later? The question for the panel is, um, the grievance panel, and then maybe the hearing panel, if they also have questions, is if it's, a, it's been, if it's a leak in your roof, and you've known you've had this leak for the last three years that you've lived in your house, but you just now at year three decided to look into it and discover that the seller did, or the agent didn't disclose something, yeah, maybe you just now knew, but reasonable diligence dictates that you should have discovered that within the first couple of, years, uh, the first couple of months of the start of leaking, if you've known about it for that long. So like I said, once again, this is not an administrative issue that's just as simple as 180 days, do we know about it, you know, move on. Um, and the ethics question is, if the facts and the complaint are taken as true as given, then is there a potential violation of the code of ethics? So similarly to arbitration words, if the facts taken as true on its face, and this is the grievance panel's role. The grievance panel is going to get several cases each meeting usually. If you're lucky, you get one. Don't expect that very often. <laughs> but the grievance panel is, they get the, you guys will get the complaint or request only. So you're not making a finding of any violations. You're not making a finding of any fees owed. You're saying, if this is true on its face, is there a potential violation? Is this an arbitrable issue on its face? And if the answer is yes, then grievance panel, your job is done, and you push it forward to a hearing. And that hearing panel will then review the case the complaint that was filed, and then we would reach out to the respondent, let them know, hey, a complaint's been filed, please follow your response. And a hearing panel would hear from both sides and make the ultimate finding of wrongdoing or fees owed in vain. So during the grievance panel, though, if we're still looking at ethics, there's, the considerations are, are the right articles cited? Should articles be deleted or added? So as I said earlier, Lily and I will check the E1 and make sure that everything is filled out correctly. Um, we'll make sure that everything is filled out, is filled out correctly. Um, are the right articles cited? That's for you guys to decide. What we tell complainants, especially in most of the complaints, I would say all of them, most complaints are going to come from members of the public. And what we're going to tell them is, here's the code of ethics. I'm not going to tell them this is what you should be filing, this is what you should allege, because when it comes up in a hearing, well, Christina or Lily said this article was the one that was right, the respondent is now very put off, and rightfully so, that we have taken the side of the complaining party. So what I tell them, what I um, encourage Lily to tell them is that, here's the code. The articles are broad. If you're having trouble finding the exact article that fits your complaint, it's probably because you're looking at your complaint too narrowly. You're not, yes, there's, not, there's nothing about a leak. In the, in the code, but if you step back, there's things about proper disclosure, things along those lines. So we tell the complaint, do your best, fill out the article, obviously we'll make sure articles are listed, not standards of practices, but just do your best. Um, and you might get them wrong, and the grievance panel has that latitude to say, okay, this isn't quite what this article is talking about. Um, a lot of times, the members of the public will allege Article 3 because they didn't feel that someone was cooperating, that's not the cooperation that Article 3 talks about. Article 3 is in reference to cooperation with other agents to get the transaction done, not just, I don't feel like, I feel like you're being rude and uncooperative in spirit. So, and the panel can also, the grievance panel can also, also add articles. Maybe you cite Article 2 because you didn't disclose that leak, but you knew about it. And the grievance panel might say, well, you know what, if you knew about it, you weren't treating the other party honestly, so let's slap on Article 1 as well. So they have that authority too. Um, what I don't allow generally is blank, the form could be left blank with no article cited because at the end of the day, the panel, you guys as the panels do so much. You guys are kind of that first step to distinguish what is frivolous, what has a basis to move forward on, and what doesn't. And it's not your role to say, here are all the article, articles that you missed. Now obviously they may miss some, but they need to put forth their best effort. And if they leave it blank, 
it shouldn't ever come to you at this level point, but if it does, really, it's not properly filled out and it should be dismissed on that grounds alone. Um, but like I said, it shouldn't come to you just blank. It also should not come to you with Articles 1 through 17 listed. <laughs> that also happens sometimes. It should never get to you. Lily or I should be able to grab it beforehand, but maybe we're busy and you see our, and that's some, you know, someone on the panel will get the materials ahead of time. Let us know that this isn't properly put off. Somebody puts Article 1 through 17 is not trying. They are just putting everything they can, and they don't want to, they're not taking this process to go seriously, and they're not putting forth their best effort. I have yet to see a case that where all 17 articles are potentially viable. Thank you. So, are all the proper parties named? This is, so the grievance panel has the authority and the ability to add parties that maybe have been left off. Maybe this agent doesn't want to follow against her own, um, her own broker, who maybe just as, just as much at fault, but they just want to blame the other side because they like their, they like their agent. But the facts clearly indicate that both probably have a role in this. The grievance panel can add parties, and they can also add brokers, um, because at the end of the day, the broker is responsible for the actions of their agent. Now, the grievance panel should not just automatically add a broker to every complaint in which the broker is not listed, but if the facts you know, seem to indicate maybe a lack of training, a lack of, you know, that the agent should have really known or should have known, gone to their you know, broker for some guidance and they did not, they may look in the broker so that, you know, the broker is also on the hook, can be on the hook but it should not be the default of the grievance panel just to always add the, the broker. So if there is a possible violation of the Code of Ethics, um, then yeah, so the ethics complaints that allege a possible violation of the code are then going to be reviewed to see if there's a potential citation. So like the mediation process, the citation um, policy was implemented as of April 1st, um, 2019 as well. Um, unlike mediation where we've had a handful of mediation so far since April 1st, we have yet to have a citation. So citations, the way the citation works is that NAR has what they call a model citation policy. There are certain, not every article is going to be citable, not every type of action is going to be citable. So they have their list, their model on their the model citation policy list. Our professional standards committee, about a year and a half, two years ago, started going through this process of determining whether or not we want to have a citation policy. And they eventually said yes, and they selected some what they perceived as straightforward articles that didn't really leave a lot of grounds for kind of dispute at a hearing. To uh, be cited. So, if the, once the grievance panel decides that there's a potential violation, if the articles are citable, then the next step is to determine whether or not the um, complaint is eligible for a citation. So, if the complaint lists only non citable offenses, then the complaint is automatically forwarded to a hearing. So, uh, that is a lot of our complaints. And also, if the complaint lists both citable and non citable offenses, the complaint is forwarded for a hearing. So we don't distinguish if some of your actions are citable but some of your actions are not, we're not going to separate the two, we're just going to move it all forward for a hearing. And this is where I think a lot of our ethics complaints fall in, is that there might be citable actions in it, but we are still not citable, so we can't just issue issue a citation. And then if the complaint lists only citable offenses, the citation is sent to the respondent. Um, the respondent has the right to respond and request a hearing. So a respondent never loses his right to a, his or her right to a hearing, if you have their cited. Um, or they can accept the citation, say yes, I said this was a four bedroom house, but it was really a three bedroom house. There's nothing to dispute. I accept the citation. I'm going to pay. It's a hundred fifty dollar fine, and then I'm going to take the code of ethics, of course. And there's no hearing. It is what it is. Once it's the bill is closed, and we move on. That all sounds nice, guys. We have not, like I said, have not had a citation yet, so that's gonna be fun the first time we have one to bumble our way through it together. So, um, but yeah, so as of now, we have had zero citations, but that doesn't mean that um, there are in the future. So the next several slides are various citable offenses. I'm not going to sit here and read them all to you, um, but for those who are on grievance, you will have this list of citation um, of citable offenses. Um, what will generally happen, and the reason why um, 
a lot of times, for those of you guys who have served off groups before, we don't really even get to the citation conversation because based on what you're alleging already, there's already non citable offenses, so we don't even need to kind of go through this list to see if there's potential if the complaint lists non citable offenses to begin with. And you guys find a potential violation of that non citable offense. But as you'll see, many of these are going to be, if it's true, you know, if you advertise property for sale or lease without the authority of the listing of your owner or listing broker, I mean, you did it or you didn't. Now, if, you're, if someone's lying about it, obviously you want to go to a hearing and say, I absolutely did not, or they absolutely gave me authorization, here's my email, here's my text message. But if you didn't do it, I mean, if you did it, I don't know, you know, the purpose of saying, why do you want to go in front of a hearing? You know, you can, obviously, if you're right, but, or you can accept the citation. They're, these are supposed to be, are intended to be actions in which if it was done, there's not a lot of wiggle room to kind of interpret another way. How many citations can a realtor get before y'all stop dealing with that particular realtor? So citations can be no more than, and like I said, we haven't done some. So our policy, and I do apologize, I don't recall off the top of my head, I believe it's two within 12 months. After the third one within 12 months, it's automatically for, for a hearing. So if you get two citations um, within a 12 month period on your third, reported for a hearing, and if you get three in 12 in two years. Then you're no longer doing it. No, no longer be a citation. And then it goes forward to a hearing. Because we're not going to like essentially let you off with a $150 fine. And yet another code of ethics class that doesn't very much mean anything to you. At that point, you need to go to a hearing panel. They need to hear that you've been cited, that it's still happening over and over again for the same action. And then you have, you know, and then it's, you know, the discipline may be more severe at that point. Because with citation, this is the prescribed discipline. If you should you elect to accept the citation. So at some point, you know, you're fine and your class probably isn't doing much, which is why, you know, it's, you've got to, we do have that policy in place two and, I'm fairly sorry, it's two and 12 months, three and two years. Anything after that, we'll get away here. Um, so yes, I'm not going to so for those who are in grievance, um, with your checklist, with your code of ethics, you'll also have insightful offenses. And like I said, um, Lily and I will generally I'm generally not going to bring your attention to it if there's an article in there that doesn't fall into the cite citation. But if it's just citable, if it's just articles that have that could fall under the citation policy, at that point we would then say, hey, let's go through the citation thing. And maybe it's still the actions, even though it's Article 16, maybe it's something else other than the specific action. And then it would still go forward to a hearing. Yes. Okay. What's it doing with the grievance panel? Has it changed a lot? about having to take them out of review and figure out if they're sidebar or not sidebar? Um, I think that, so we did this, when we did the, so the question was, how does this affect the grievance panel's review? And I think that, you know, last year was the first year we kind of did the training in January, and, but it wasn't required at the time. So this is the first time we're kind of doing the training where it's already part of the process, it's been part of the process, even though we haven't had any citations yet. Um, I, having not had any citations, I don't really know, to be honest. I think that it's important to make sure our group's panel is trained, but, and I, when I review complaints and what I um, will encourage Lily, or have tried to encourage Lily to do as well as like when we review it, is to kind of make sure that we, our attention is drawn to certain things, you know? If we think that something that was over 180 days, we know that the group's panel has four other cases to to address, so we might say, hey, FYI, there might be a time frame, a time issue here. And if something appears like it might be citable, we'll say, hey, you know, this may need further review if there is a possible violation. We may then need to instruct the as a citable offense. So a lot of times articles are based on the complaint, like I said, because most complaints are not going to list just citable offenses. <coughs> most of them are going to list things that are that require going forward to a hearing, and when they do, Given how busy the grievance panel is already, I don't require I don't make them take the time to go through that extra step of is it citable? Here's what the citations are. It has a non-citable effect. So you're mostly doing that. You and Lily are making that determination before it gets to the table. We're seeing what's there, and then I in the past, like there aren't that many of them, but when there is something that needs to be kind of noted as a potential need to take the next steps potentially, then we would. And so that would be. Um, but in theory, but it's important for the group panel to know this because, like I said, we may miss it as well. We definitely miss things as well. So the group panel um, 
if they dismiss the complaint as either not being arbitrable, excuse me, or um, not, there's no potential violation of the Code of Ethics, they have, the complaint has 20 days to appeal. Um, if they appeal the decision, it's reviewed by a completely different grievance panel, and that grievance panel basically does a new review and says, hey, um, there is the complaint says, I don't think this first grievance panel got it right. They're clearly a bunch of know nothings. New grievance panel, hopefully, they'll be better. And the grievance panel can say, nope, they were right. You're just a disgruntled buyer. You're just, you know, this isn't this isn't the right form for you. And they can dismiss it again. If they dismiss it again, the case is closed. We're not going to give someone unlimited time to appeal. They get one chance. If it is, but the second grievance panel can say, you know what, I think the first grievance panel did get it wrong, and we're going to push it forward for a hearing. And then if they do that, it's, we just kind of pick it up from there, send the complaint to the response, let the respondent know the complaint's been filed, get the response, kind of just move it forward through our process as usual. So the grievance panel can dismiss arbitration requests, they can dismiss uh, ethics complaints in whole or in part. So if the grievance panel says, yes, we're gonna move this complaint forward, but Article 2 isn't applicable, the, you know, there was no, we didn't see any concealment or misrepresentation. If the complaint feels, the complaint still has the opportunity to appeal that dismissal. So if they choose to appeal the dismissal of an article, it would still go to a new grievance panel for a review of that article's dismissal. Um, and if the grievance panel thinks that it should, agrees with the first, they dismiss it and that article is no longer part of the complaint. Um, so we have withdrawn evidence complaints. Because the complaint was pushed forward by the grievance panel, all withdrawals of complaints have to also be approved and go through the um, grievance panel as well. The grievance panel can only move the complaint forward when there's a potential violation of public trust as defined by NAR, which are these three situations. Misappropriation of client or customer funds or property, willful discrimination, or fraud, fraud resulting in substantial economic harm. So the purpose of this is, let's say that I forgot to send out the listing agreement because I'm so used to it being in the loop. My current client doesn't use a loop. I was supposed to mail it to them, snail mail, email, but I forgot. I'm not used to, this isn't my standard practice, I forgot. My client gets frustrated with me, they file a complaint, alleging Article 9. You didn't furnish it, Art Article 9 and Article 1. Not looking out for my best interest, you're not getting me my copies. And Article 9, because you didn't give me a copy, as required by it, by Article 9. I get the complaint, it goes to grievance. I get the complaint and I say, oh no, that's, you know, I, I really forgot, it was an accident, this isn't my standard you know, operating process, it, it was just truly a mistake. Maybe I ask um, Lily to help me reach out to maybe an ombudsman to see if they'll help me work it out. Maybe I reach out directly to my former client, probably at this point they're probably complaining against me. <laughs> maybe I reach out to my former client and say, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, what would it take to make it right? You know, if I throw you a few hundred bucks, you know, will you, you know, would you drop it? Like, it was really an accident. Um, and if the complaint says, okay, if you're gonna do that, you know, it's not, I'd rather have, you know, the few hundred bucks than take it through this, this ethics process, and they are happy they withdraw it. That's going to go back to the grievance panel, like I said, for approval of that withdrawal. What NAR, and quite frankly, myself and Lily don't want to see is respondents who are trying to make right. But clearly, they've admitted to doing wrong. Clearly, they said, you know what? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And so, there's maybe clear, strong, convincing evidence that there was a violation of Article One and Nine. But I work out with the parties, and we want to give the we want to give our members that opportunity to make things right without forcing them to go through this process. If the complaining party is willing to withdraw, so the reason why it's so narrow to these three instances is that these are instances where NAR says it doesn't matter how right you make it, you can't make it right enough. If you are commingling funds, if you're cashing everyone's earnest money, using them for groceries. And this person complains about it, and I say, okay, here's your money, here's a big few bucks more, just let it go, let it go. And they say, okay, well, I made whole, what do I care? Complaint withdrawn, whatever, you know, no big deal. But the grievance panel gets it and says, absolutely not, this is not, you can't write that wrong. Even if you have for that person, this is so egregious. It has to be, that's a violation of the public trust. So it's not just for any issue, it's not just for just because, you know, 
there was like a failure to send a document when we were supposed to. It has to be a very serious violation of the public trust for the agreements panel to step in and move it forward. So that's going to be the withdrawal of ethics complaints. Now, for grievance panels, for those of you guys that have served with us, you may have noticed a very nuanced difference between a withdrawn ethics complaint and an ethics complaint that goes back to the grievance panel because the complainant fails to show up for a hearing. So for the same reasons, if a complainant fails to, sh if a complainant fails to show up for a hearing, there can't be a hearing. A respondent doesn't have to show up to defend themselves. If they don't want to present their own defense, in theory, that's on them. They will get a notice. If they don't want to show up, then, you know, that's on them. They, they have the right to make that decision for themselves. But what the complainants don't have the right to do is file a complaint against our members and then not show up. Um, complaints, um, the respondent has a right to hear from the complainant about why they filed. They have a right to cross-examine them. And now, I won't say that they have to show up physically. We have Zoom. We have allowed parties to Zoom in. When there is a reason whether they moved away, a physical limitation, we do require they are in a private secure location due to the confidential nature of these processes. But they have to be present in some capacity, the complaint. And when they fail to show up, then we can't have the hearing. The complaint is sent back to the grievance panel for consideration. And in this instance, the grievance panel may push the complaint forward if they determine that there is clear, strong, convincing proof um, that there is a potential violation. The complaint is amended to list a member of the grievance panel as the new complaint comes. Now, this is a little bit of a different standard, obviously, withdrawing versus um, a failure to show up. Because with a, in a failure to show up, I don't know, as a I'm not, I haven't necessarily tried to work it out with you as a respondent. But at the same time, so the grievance panel may say, we still want to take this forward. And if there's clear, strong, convincing evidence, a grievance panelist may, and we've had that happen once in the five years I've been here. But it was pretty, based on the documentation that was provided, there wasn't a lot to dispute. Um, generally speaking, though, however, you have to remember that as a grievance panelist, if you feel strong, if you feel that this needs to go forward a hearing, and you are willing to step in as a new complainant to represent the grievance panel, what you have to remember is your burden is still clear, strong, and convincing, which we'll get to at the hearing, when we get to the hearing. And a lot of times, based on what is provided to you, how can you testify and provide clear, strong, convincing evidence of something that you don't have any knowledge of, much less first-hand knowledge of. And so every now and then, like I said, it's happened, and there's, and sometimes the panel will really consider whether or not they want to move it forward if it needs to move forward based on this. But I think that any panel that wants to still push it forward where a complaint has failed to show up has to understand that their burden as the grievance panel doesn't, as the complaint doesn't change just because there are grievance that they still have to meet those thresholds. And that threshold, as a complainant who bears the burden of proof, is difficult to meet when you have no knowledge, much less, you know, no first-hand knowledge, no actual knowledge of the facts that were provided by the initial complainant. And for those of you guys who have served with I think rightly or wrongly, what also plays in the fact is that you as a complainant have filed a complaint against our member and have, have even respected our process enough to show up for a hearing. And that is, you know, for right or for wrong, a factor in it because you know if you're going to file it, why should we take it seriously if you can't take it seriously? Um, is there any questions about? I know that's a, that's a very nuanced difference with drawing versus a failure to attend. For those who are on grievance, are there any questions or anything? Okay. I'm going to pretend I'm doing a really good job and that it's not three in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so scheduling a hearing, it's typically done weeks and weeks in advance. Um, there's the availability of myself or Lily. There is volunteer, you guys, there's your availability. There is board room availability. If we're not here, you know, we've got to coordinate with the board on the board room schedule of, you know, the local board. They may have committee meetings. They may have other things going on. They may have classes going on. So there's a lot of coordination involved. Then you're going to add in the party availability, uh, council in this availability is <coughs> applicable. So this is a lot of moving pieces, and this is why I was saying earlier, <coughs> I hate for those who serve on um, professional standards hearing panels, I'm sorry in advance for all the emails that you will get asking you to serve, and then for all the follow-up emails that say, just kidding. <laughs> we'll try again next time. So that is going to happen, and it's you know we do our best to confirm with the parties 
is this data available for you? Because that's kind of the first thing. Is this data available for you and your witnesses? And we give them a few days to respond. And then, you know, we're also at the same time trying to make sure that the boardroom, if it's our boardroom, it's a little bit easier. If we have to check with the other boardroom, maybe hopefully they've already gotten that tentative date on hold. And then we're trying to put together volunteers. So it's it's a lot of moving pieces. And you will get lots of emails that say, sir, just kidding, <laughs> next time. <clears throat> Um, so a respondent also has the ability to waive his or her right to a hearing. And this is not the same thing as a citation. So if you're waiving your right to a hearing, these were basically non-citable offenses that went before, you know, that went before the grievance panel. Um, but you can say, you know what, I, those actions are true. And then you can waive the right to your hearing in front of your peers. Um, you agree to the facts as presented by the complainant. Um, however, waiving one's right to a hearing does not automatically mean that one has violated the conditions. <coughs> when you waive your right to a hearing, you're saying, yes, these facts are true. The hearing panel must still meet an executive to um, yes. The hearing panel will still meet an executive session and determine if the code was violated based on the agreement that, yes, the complaint's facts are true. What will happen a lot of times is we'll get people who don't respond to who say that they don't want to show up. This is completely, you know, I don't want to show up. This is completely frivolous, a waste of time. This, there's no basis in fact for this. I'm just going to waive my right to a hearing. And what I we tell them is, you know what, you may want to reconsider that because when you waive your right to a hearing, yes, you can provide a response. Maybe there's mitigating facts. You know, maybe, yes, I forgot to send the agreement because it's not my standard process because I do use a loop, but also, you know, my significant other was sick and it just was not, your sending your agreement was not high on my priority list, sorry. Um, and I can say that I can admit, and I, I can include mitigating circumstances in my response that maybe the executive panel or the hearing panel is taking into consideration during executive session. But what I can't say if I want to waive my right to a hearing is, well, that's not true because I sent it to you ahead of time. Well, if I want to waive my right to a hearing, I got I stipulate to their, the claims facts as being true. So I don't ever encourage respondents who want to dispute any of the facts to waive the right to a hearing. So the purpose of the hearing, so unlike the grievance panel where you guys meet in the video conference world and you guys review lots of cases at once and you make a determination of whether or not if the facts were true on its face, is there a potential violation? The hearing panel hears from all parties. They determine who is entitled to the fee or commission and what, or whether or not there's a violation of the code of ethics by the respondent. So the hearing panel hears one case. They don't hear, and they hear the case from start to finish from both parties, unlike the grievance panel, like I said, who reads and reviews several cases from one side only. Um, Things to remember during the hearing. For those of you guys who are hearing panelists, um, please remember that the complainant holds the burden of proof when for proving their case. Um, you guys are so familiar with the code, and you guys are instant to catch on. You know what? I think this is what I'm hearing. Let me see if I can make sure that this is what they're saying. If that's what they're saying, there's a violation. You know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take them down this route to kind of make sure that's not. Your role is to ask clarifying questions, but your role isn't to try the case. Your role is to hear the facts and then make a determination. It is the complainant's responsibility and burden to prove their case. Um, please be cautious about, about leading questions. Um, generally speaking, it's not a huge issue, um, uh, but for those of you guys who are new, who's not hearing panels, you may hear things, and I hear things, and Lily hears things, and you just want to be like, what were you thinking when you? <laughs> like, why in the world would you have? Didn't you realize you were acting dumb? <laughs> you know, and that, those are the kind of questions that you, you need to avoid, because that is give the appearance of bias. And whether or not you are, it, it comes across as bias. And be, please remember that these ethics and arbitration hearings are also recorded. The grievance panel on hearing on meetings are not, but the actual hearings are. And those questions, while maybe you don't intend them to, 
those come across in a way, especially leading questions, when you re listen to those recordings, so let's quote people to see if there is any bias, any procedural issues. So definitely be cautious about your leading questions. You know, if you're trying to get to the fact that you don't think someone submitted something timely, the question is, well, why did isn't why did you submit it timely? Is when did you submit it? That you know, and, and you have to be very impartial. Um, Remember to ask relevant questions. For the most part, this isn't too much of an issue. However, not every transaction, not every part of an aspect of a transaction is relevant to the code of ethics complaint. So sometimes it's important to remember, especially with like complicated facts and circumstances, that is to bring it, let's bring it back to the code, let's bring it back to the actual complaint. Let's, you know, kind of stay focused. Yes, it's relevant, maybe it's talking or asked about the transaction, but if it doesn't have to do with the code, please processes are already kind of complicated in and of themselves. Let's not take it down a path that doesn't need to go down. Um, this is probably more for me than most of our my panelists, but it's to watch your demeanor. I'm sure that you guys have gathered during this that I don't have the best poker face sometimes. I do my very best during hearings, but this also goes for you guys. Yes, your demeanor, your physical demeanor is not reported on the, um, on the reporters the way your questions are. Okay. But a, a party sees how you're reacting. And a party sees when you make the what in the world were you thinking face, even if you're not asking that <laughs> So that, yeah, so people see that, and that is, even if it doesn't create any, even if it doesn't create bias, that leads to the potential of feeling like there is bias and, impart and impartiality to the other party. So, but like I said, that's probably more, like sometimes I think you'll see me just like looking down and I can't even look at anybody because I don't want <laughs> anything to be given away. So for arbitration hearings that involve procuring calls. Does someone have a question? Uh, let's see. Was there a question out there, guys? No. No? Okay. So for arbitration hearings involving procuring calls, procuring calls defined by NAR is the initiation of the unbroken chain of causal events that result in a successful transaction defined as a sale that closes or at least that is executed. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, there has to be a closing. And it can't be in this, I should have, could have, would have received a commission if you had messed up. Um, also, what I'd like to kind of emphasize for those of you guys who stood on a panel, and those of you guys who are brokers as well, who may end up in front of a panel on behalf of your agent, is that just because you're sitting in front of a panel in an arbitration hearing, it doesn't mean that you or your agent have done anything wrong. A lot of times, and I think I probably picked this up from my panels, the quote of buyers or liars, you know, like a lot of times it's going to be your clients who have really just signed two different exclusive agreements Maybe you really asked the questions you were supposed to, and you had no idea there was this other agent in the background. Like, you did everything you could. And those are, there are situations that will get in front of our arbitration panels, and that's truly the case. And it is the buyer who have, who have who pitted two of our members against one another to get the best deal for themselves. So just because, to keep in mind for those of us who are sitting as a panelist, but also those who may end up in front of our panel on behalf of your agent, or on behalf of yourself, that ending up in front of our panel for an arbitration, doesn't mean that there's anything that's been done wrong. And there's a good faith business dispute. Maybe not always, sometimes there is that really if you just parachuting agent. <laughs> but you can end up in front of our panel and really have not done anything wrong. And this is just something that you need our panel as an benefit to help you decide. Um, as it says, there's no threshold rule, so there's no I should the property first rule. And many times design by the agreement <coughs> is irrelevant. Your buyer brokerage agreement, guys, I'm going to go on my high horse from a forms committee perspective. Your buyer brokerage agreement protects your commission from your buyer. It does not entitle you to a commission from the listing agent. So the listing agent has an obligation to pay a co-op commission, co commission to the procuring agent. Now, maybe the argument may be, well, the, agent should have, the listing agent should have known that I was the procuring agent. It is what it is. You can, you have, you can file for arbitration with the other buyer's agent. but both buyer's agents, hopefully, especially if you're at the point where you're saying I was procuring cause, has some sort of agreement in place to protect themselves against the buyers who put them in these unfortunate circumstances. So the non-prevailing party can still pursue, if they wish, the buyer for that commission. 
assuming that your buyer brokerage agreement says that they will pay, yeah, they'll pay whatever it is that you guys have agreed upon. So that is my forms soapbox for the day. <laughs> the burden of proof. Um, so for arbitrations, the burden of proof is a preponderance of the evidence. So this is basically, I believe this broker is the broker. I believe that this broker is the procuring cause slightly more than I believe this other broker is the procuring cause. It's basically a 51% rule. I slightly believe this one, this one more. And for those of you guys who are going to eventually sit on our panels, for those of you guys who have sat on our panels, you guys know that not, especially in arbitrations, and especially, like I said, where it is just a good faith business dispute between two brokers who try to do everything right, it's not always easy. It's not always easy to determine who is procuring cause, but there is really, and this is why we um, don't encourage panels to split the baby, because there is usually only one procuring cause. And it's a hard decision to make, but it's, it doesn't have, decisions don't have to be unanimous. It's a majority decision, but it's not always easy. And so, to keep in mind that it just, it's a slightly more 51% preponderance of the evidence. Ethics complaints, on the other hand, are clear, or strong, and convincing. So this means that you're very certain, based on what was provided to you, that, that there is a clear ethics violation. It's not, you know, if someone is just a he said, she said, the panel should be, I mean, obviously what the panel takes into consideration is how remorseful someone, how, what their demeanor is, are they, you know, why. But you need to feel clearly, strongly, and convincingly that there was a violation. If you're just unsure, but you know what, I think that the agent probably just needs to learn a lesson and probably just needs to be found in violation just to make sure they don't put themselves in this position next time. That's not clear, strong, and convincing. And we would go through this with each and every article. So just because there is one violation of, art of an article doesn't necessitate that there is clear, strong, convincing evidence of a violation of another. So it's, if more than one article is alleged, it's clear, strong, and convincing evidence that each violation has occurred. Um, so in your executive session, arbitrations, there are no findings of facts. Thank goodness. I mean, it is, I mean, the discussions in arbitration executive sessions are already difficult enough without having to try to articulate why one broker is more entitled than the other to, a, to, to the monies. Um, for ethics, realtors can only be found in violation of the actual articles as we talked about several times. The standards of practices, as well as case interpretations, however, can be used in support of a finding or no finding of a violation. And both of those are official policies of NAR. So if we kind of go back to the example where, of the unauthorized access to property, if we find by clear or strong convincing evidence that there was un unauthorized access to the property um, on terms not agreed to by either the listing agent or, a, um, or the seller, depending on which article you're alleging, then you can say that, that we find a violation of this of the article itself based upon um, standard practice which says this. Um, so the question is, was there a violation of the articles alleged to have been, was there a violation of the articles alleged to have been, was there a violation, violation was, or was there a violation? Violations of the code do not have to be intentional, guys. So this kind of goes back to the whole example of I didn't get a listing agreement, sign listing agreement to you on time. It wasn't intentional. I don't know how many hearings we've really ever had where the respondent was looking for every which way to violate the code. They were just doing everything they could to violate every article. That doesn't really happen. What happens more often than not is, yes, maybe there's a careless um, Realtor, maybe there was a realtor who really didn't know, maybe they did something very unintentionally, or maybe they just don't care, maybe they're not intentionally trying to violate the code, but they just don't really give the code that makes two thoughts. But most of the time, violations are not intentional. So if the code of ethics was accidentally or mistakenly violated, that should be reflected in the discipline imposed. So it's unfair, and I think that it it's difficult to um, for the to, to educate the realtor when you say, well, she was obviously very remorseful when she didn't send out that listing agreement sign when she was supposed to. She clearly was upset. She sent it as soon as she was asked. Um, you know, look, 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 there's no violation, guys. It, it, 
it's not a big deal. You know, she, she fixed the wrong. Well, the issue is that it doesn't matter. This is what the article says. Upon its initial or signing, I need a second. It was an accident, and that's fine. And what can happen is that can be reflected in the discipline. Maybe you guys decide that all I deserve is a letter of warning. Maybe you guys decide, you know what, a class doesn't really matter, but she understands. Like, this wasn't an accident. I mean, this was an accident. It's not repeat behavior. Let's just give her a letter of warning. Or the panel also has the ability, and it doesn't happen quite as often, to issue no discipline and say, this process was enough. She, she gets it. She obviously was remorseful. She did right before really this complaint was filed, but the person you know was wanting more to be done. So you can't violate the article a little bit. You either did it or you didn't. Your intentions, though, can be reflected in your discipline. Does that make sense? So disciplining a role to her respondent um, if they find a violation, then you have to determine the appropriate discipline, if any. So like I said, it doesn't there. Discipline is not required, but generally speaking, something is usually given, even if it's a letter of warning. Um, the hearing panel should consider previous violations and sanctions. So after the hearing panel says, yes, there is no potential violation, then myself or Lily will say, well, this person has not been found in any violation before. Excuse me. Um, this is our first time, and it's a progressive discipline. So let's, like I said, let's give her a letter of warning, no big deal. But maybe you find out, you know, it seemed like it was an accident. She seemed like she was remorseful, but actually this is her second time in which this has happened, actually. And it's a progressive discipline. And so you want to consider maybe that letter of warning just wasn't enough, actually. Maybe she does need some education or a fine. Um, but you can take this into consideration if it's the same, if it's the same behavior that you're in front of a panel for as before. Tony? At the point where you inform us of previous infractions, do you also inform us of the discipline imposed? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, um, when I informed the, when we informed the executive, uh, the hearing panel during executive session, if there was previous discipline, do we tell about the previous discipline imposed? And the answer is yes, so that you understand, so that you know what is progressive from there. But we will only tell you this once you tell us yes, there is a violation. So if you tell us no, there is no violation, but there was. They were they violated an um, they were under a violation previously, you'll never know because there's no need to impose discipline. And the reason for this is that once you hear that there was a, a violation before, you can't unhear that. As much as you try not to want to hold that against someone, you can't unhear the fact that there has been a violation before. And maybe this time we should just find a violation. Maybe we should find because clearly they just don't care about a code and even though this time may not have done it, they're doing something that brings it and that's also inappropriate. So we will only tell you guys once you guys say there's a violation of this article, and yes, we are now we need to discipline them. Yes. Okay, so, and this could be a rumor that's not necessarily true, but is there a way for like our AEs to see that a previous realtor has been disciplined? Isn't there a, I thought there was. So if there is, could I go to my AE and say, has this realtor been disciplined before? So the question for those Not who, that I would. The I'm just saying this, that that's out there. Right. And then so the question for those in video land is, you know, uh, is there a way basically that the that an agent can go to their AE and figure out, you know, if another agent's been in violation of the code? So the first answer is you're not wrong. Because we handle this on behalf of the local board, all decisions are sent back to the local board. And we tell them, here is the decision, it's been finalized, we're going to follow up with discipline. As part of this process, we handle everything for you, but because it's your member, here is the decision. This is confidential, though, guys, and they should not be confirming or denying anything for you. I just heard that. Yeah. So they, that have that, they have that information because it's available to them, it's supposed to go into the realtor file as if they help, as if they um, did the hearing themselves, because in theory, they're supposed to. Right. So, yes, they have that information, but they should not, just as we will not disclose that information of whether or not, and this is not public or common knowledge, this is something that goes into the realtor file, to the AEs. We, yes, we keep track of it, but we do not just tell members of the public, we just do not tell those who are just generally inquiring. So it's not in a newsletter like it is for Alabama? It's in a newsletter. 
they're not going to understand. They think that a code of ethics and license law class is a slap on the wrist. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's not going to decide. But they are never, because they're not going to, they don't get money from this process. What, and what they are a lot of times looking for is what they feel is to be justice. But our process is here to educate our members. It's here to make sure that our members act according, in, according to our code of ethics and are better in the future. And so, and that's how we have progressive discipline. Maybe in your first time that you made a mistake, and hopefully we've disciplined you appropriately to make sure that you know better in the future. So that is, um, that's when it can be helpful, but it doesn't have to, um, it doesn't have to be given. Do you see a lot of buyers and sellers, once they realize that they're not gonna get compensation, they just drop it? Uh, so the question is, um, buyers and sellers, when they realize our process doesn't give them compensation, they just drop it? Um, Many do. Um, obviously, many don't when you see the number of hearings or complaints that we receive. Um, but some do. Some will call and be like, "Well, this is you know, I want to, I want money for this." And you have to explain to them, "Well, you need to go through small claims court, or you need to go through the legal system, and then they, we don't hear from them again." So, some, but not. I mean, I would say most or even many. So this is all the different forms of discipline that can be imposed upon a realtor. <laughs> so um, keeping in mind suspension or termination of ML MLS rights and privileges, here at the association we don't have that authority. We can't affect your MLS privileges. So FYI, for those who serve on professional students panels who want to take away someone's MLS rights and privileges, we can't because we don't have an MLS for us. So that is kind of a one note about that. Um, the hearing panel can do a combination of, like, you don't have to just one. So it's common to do a letter of warning or reprimand, maybe some classes, and depending on the severity of the violation, maybe a, um, a fine of some sort. Um, you can also do probation. So probation is not a form of discipline. And I know it sounds counterintuitive, but, with, but basically what happens is the discipline is held in advance. And if the member is not found in violation again within that probationary period of no more than a year, then whatever discipline was held in advance and held in probation is considered the um, If the discipline is multi part, the hearing panel can choose to require the member to complete one portion while holding another in probation, not more than a year. Um, so, keeping with the probation part, so what typically would happen for particularly egregious behavior that the panel feels strongly about? But they aren't sure maybe maybe you don't want to suspend it because maybe it's a broker who has agents and a quick membership lesson is if the broker is a realtor all your agents are supposed to be a realtor or are supposed to be part of the board if the broker is not part of the board none of the agents can be part of the board so if for whatever reason this is a broker who comes to us and they're planning to get suspended then all of their agents member realtor memberships are also affected now the depending on how large the broker is there may there might be another broker or that you can kind of sub in as a designated realtor broker for the time being, for the period of suspension or probation, etc. cetera. Um, but say that you, so say you're having these concerns about suspending a broker, um, but the behavior really you feel may, might really warrant it. So you can say, you know what, we're gonna do a letter of warning, a letter of reprimand, we're gonna make you take, you know, 15 hours of classes, and we're also gonna slap on a $2,000 fine and a 45 days suspension but what we want to do is hold that 45 day suspension in, in advance and put you on probation so you still have to complete these other things you're still going to get a warning you still have to pay a fine you still have to take these classes we're not going to suspend you if for you know the period of a year or however long your probation period lasts as we've decided as long as you don't come before us in this year period if you come back before us within this year period and you're found in violation again then not only are you dealing with whatever new discipline you have, you're also being suspended. And so that's how probation works. Um, so we don't have it too often, like I said, I don't know that the panel finds a need to put a fine or class on probation. It's usually kind of reserved for those times where you might want to suspend a membership or do something pretty severe. Appealing a decision. So arbitration, <laughs> the parties cannot appeal because they hate the outcome. They think it's just the absolute wrong outcome, and they hate it, and what, like, what kind of panel did Chris and Emily really put together? What a, bunch of, you know, what a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing. Too bad, so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Your only basis for appeal is procedural. So this is why it's so important. You know, except for 
you guys to be prepared. This is the role of ours, myself and William to make sure that you guys, from a procedural standpoint, are allowed in cross examination, aren't just you know paint showing favoritism, understanding you know what you need to do to make sure that we have a fair hearing because we don't want to have to have a whole new hearing again with a new panel and redo this. So for arbitrations, either party can appeal, but their only basis for appeal uh, would be the lack mm -hmm. of due process. For ethics, the complainant also has that limited ability to appeal. They can only appeal for lack of due process or other procedural deficiencies. However, the respondent has the ability to uh, appeal for three different reasons. One of them being lack of due process. If there's ever anything wrong, really <coughs> due process with a hearing, anyone going to be allowed to appeal if there's a procedural issue. Uh, the respondent, though, can also say that there's an application of the Article of Code of Ethics in the facts. So here are the facts, but this is not what Article 3 talks about. Article 3 is about cooperation. Your facts are all talking about advertising and marketing. This doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't get it. And so I can appeal on this application of the facts of the Code of Ethics. But did you say that that normally gets caught in the very beginning of the process? That it's the wrong article? Is that what you're saying? So this isn't that it's the wrong article, it's just that the facts, you're trying to fit facts to an article that is, there's no violation. It, it, these facts don't go with the article, but it, this is the decision of the panel, not the um, facts that the parties have put forth. So the panel is maybe trying to fit a violation somewhere where there isn't. Okay. I'm kind of stretching it. And then the third reason that the respondent can appeal is the discipline recommended. And the respondent can appeal on any one, two, or three, one only, two only, three only, only combination thereof, all of them. Most respondents are going to mark every box and just see what gets stuck. Um, so the discipline recommended by the hearing panel, this is when I really messed up, I got to send the thing, then send you the listing agreement. And you have decided to slap me with a five thousand dollar fine, and you're like, "This is, you know, you should have known better. Here's a fine for you, but then you won't do it again." Well, yeah, I probably won't. But this is, you know, a, the the discipline is too severe for the violation found. So appeal hearings for those of you guys. So the way we put together hearing panels, um, appeal hearing panels, is the same way we put together professional standards panels. We pull from the same group of professional standards was that we get from all of our local boards. We don't um, use the same members though. So if you're an ombudsman for a case or a mediator, you won't then also be on the grievance panel. You also won't be on the arbitration. So you can serve, you get to serve one role in the process of a, of a complaint. Now you might get to serve, you can serve, and many of you guys, especially for local boards, might serve on grievance panels and professional standards panels. But when it comes time to cases, you'll serve in one role for that case. So this isn't going to be a rehearing of the case on the merits. We're going to pull together a new appeal hearing panel. Um, and the appeal hearing, guys, is going to be between the appellant or the person filing the appeal and the hearing panel. So this isn't, like I said, this isn't a hearing to rehear the case. It's to say, I'm appealing this because you as a panel, generally represented by the chairperson sometimes, if the chairperson can't be available, we might pull a different person from the panel and say, you know, ask them to step in and represent them in the hearing in the appeal hearing and say, I, you really messed up. I'm appealing this because you just did it, you just did something wrong. And it's between you and not the other party initially, but the panel. Um, the appeal hearing tribunal is tasked with determining whether or not appropriate procedures were followed during the initial hearing. Um, the standard of proof for appeal hearings. If the appeal hearing is on the misapplication or misinterpretation of the article of the code of ethics, the consideration for the appeal panel is the correctness of the hearing panel's decision. Is I mean, here are the facts, this is what it says, this is what the code says, does this seem correct? It's the, based on the correctness of the decision. Um, hearings, uh, appeal hearings based on procedural issues is basically to determine whether the effect of the deficiency was to deny the appellant a fair hearing. So the person who's alleging an unfair hearing is going to probably allege anything and everything else they can say to make it sound unfair. And the appeal panel will have to say, that's not a deficiency, so there is no, that's not a grounds for appeal. But let's say that there is actually something that was procedurally 
not get a permit. Maybe exhi an exhibit was submitted, exhibit A, at the hearing. And you got a chance to look at it. The panel got a chance to look at it. We forgot, to, we made copies, but we forgot to give you a copy. You take, you know, because you're entitled to have all materials that are kind of presented. But we forgot to send you home with a copy. Is that a procedural issue? I think arguably you could say yes, that's a procedural issue. You're supposed to get copies of all documents related to your case. But I think the panel is going to say, does this affect the outcome? Did this affect the outcome? Did you not receiving, if there is a procedural deficiency, did, did this procedural deficiency affect the outcome? And if the answer is no, it didn't affect the outcome, then you can still deny or review. If a respondent, sorry, if a respondent appeals, yes. Is the complaint notified of the appeal and any change in the decision or disciplinary? So, as mentioned previously, the so the question was, are is the non-appealing party notified? And the answer is yes. So the appeal hearing is between the parties, um, the party who's appealing the decision, and the hearing panel. So it could be the complaint or the respondent. Um, the other party is always notified because they are entitled to be, be they're entitled to show up to the appeal because if there is a rehearing. They have every right to understand the basis on which that um, there is a rehearing, especially if you want to rehear it on the merits and have to go through this all over again. The other, the non-appealing party is entitled to know why and to understand where how that decision was possibly made. So they are always notified, even though they are not a party to the actual appeal. They are an interested party who has the right to be present and notified of every step of the appeal process. <coughs> Um, so the arbitration appeal hearing, there are, there's really only a few potential outcomes. You can affirm the decision of the hearing panel and kind of keep it as is. Um, or you can say that there was actually a procedure <coughs> that affected the outcome and you can grant a new hearing. And granting a new hearing is a whole new panel. And like I said, we will do our best and you guys are always going to do your best to make sure that from a procedural standpoint, we don't have these issues. Um, you cannot change the award of the hearing panel because you disagree with it. No matter, the appeal panel does receive all the facts so they can understand, you know, the, the background of, the, um, of what brought them to the appeal to begin with. And we have had arbitration appeal panels that said, I would not have found this way. Well, that's not the question. The question is, was there an issue with the procedure of the first hearing? And if the answer is no, there was no issue, then you need to affirm the decision. You cannot base the fact that you would have decided differently to find there there be um, a deficiency with the hearing or the process of the hearing itself. The outcome of ethics hearings, you can affirm the decision. Um, you can modify the decision, um, including you can modify the decision, including discipline. However, the discipline cannot exceed. So you can say, you know what, that five thousand dollar fine is really, really egregious. We're going to modify it to five hundred. But what you can't do is say, well, she really needs to learn her lesson, $6,000, here you go. So you can modify it to come to reduce, but you can't modify it to exceed what was initially um, imposed. And then you can dismiss the complaint. So if the facts that were in the decision really just do not indicate a possible violation of the code, you can, the panel can just say, we're not going to remand it for a new hearing to go through this all over again. We're just going to dismiss it and say that's done. Um, generally speaking, um, if this is a potential issue, hopefully someone on the panel, one of our experienced panelists, our chairperson, myself or Lily would catch that we might be heading down this route. If, you know, you're trying, and you're gonna be, and at the end of the day, this is your decision as a panel. This is a real term of process. And I might, we're gonna do our best to guide you when we think that you are maybe heading towards out of bounds territory. But if you guys insist on trying to find a violation or you think that there isn't one, there, that this doesn't fit this article, we're gonna let you know. But if you guys insist on going down that route, that is obviously the prerogative of the panel and not the administrator. But hopefully if we saw that, we would be able to kind of talk through the issue and make sure we understand what, that, um, what why you guys are finding a potential violation if we feel that this isn't exactly what this code says. Um, and then you can refer the ethics complaint for a new hearing. If no appeal is filed, guys, the ethics decisions are must be approved by a panel of the GAR executive uh, committee. So it's not the entire executive committee, but it's a panel of five. It's usually um, a panel of our line officers. Um, they approve the decision. Um, 
And what we also do to make sure that we maintain, and we take this very seriously, we don't, we don't want to tell people unnecessarily who parties are that are involved in these ethics proceedings. So a decision when it goes to A and um, to executive committee for review for finalization, names are removed, they're referred to as complaint respondent, complaint, complaint brokerage, respondents brokerage, et cetera. So we do our best to make sure it's as anonymous as possible to continue to maintain that confidentiality. Um, so the executive committee can approve the decision of the hearing panel. If they perceive that there were potential procedural deficiencies, they still have the ability to remand it back. Even if it wasn't appealed, if, and to be quite honest, this shouldn't happen, whether in practice, but definitely not a decision, but if, if it appears in the decision, well, the, you know, the chairperson wouldn't allow the complainant to cross-examine the respondent, so no cross was given. Anyway, here's a finding of a violation. Even if it's not appealed, if that's in there, which it shouldn't be, the executive panel can say, whoa, 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 there's a procedural issue. Send it back, we need a new hearing, because that is not okay not to allow cross between parties. But that wouldn't happen, ever, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and again, if the discipline seems to, maybe I don't appeal a $5,000 fine, I'm just like, okay, fine, and whatever, it is what it is, I'm just gonna pay it and move on. Um, the executive committee can say, whoa, 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 that is not an appropriate fine, and they can modify it, but once again, they can't increase it. So for arbitration hearings, the decision becomes final 20 days after the transmittal of the decision with no appeal. So if no appeal is final, no, if no appeal is filed, the decision is final after 20 days. Um, if the non-prevailing party <coughs> does not pay the award, then the prevailing court or the prevailing party can have the award enforced in court. Just like the settlement agreement if you guys reach one in mediation. You guys can have that, the prevailing party can have that decision um, enforced awesome, from a legal standpoint. And I think that there's a few more minutes. Are there any questions? Yes. Did you get a lot of uh, pushback from complainants when you tell them the, the decision to appeal? So the question is if I get a lot of pushback when we tell them the decision of the panel. And it's not that it's pushback necessarily. It's generally, like I was saying earlier, that they just don't feel that education is really that big of a deal. They don't, and I think, we'll, and we try our best up front to educate them, educate the complaint on what our process is intended to do. And like I said, our process, for many people, they'll feel better just knowing that someone bans to someone, whether it's a role for association, they file the commission as well, that they file a complaint, hopefully the respondent has learned their life. But there are many complaints who just don't truly understand that. And you'll get complaints, and even though Lily and I have said it over and over and over to the complainant, that says, I think that they should pay me X number of dollars for all my pain and suffering, or X number of dollars because this is what it costs to replace the deck that should have been fixed, or whatever it is. And even though we told them that that is not part of our authority, they're still looking for a way to have that done. So I think that there are going to all, there's always going to be some parties who are not happy that we can't do, that they feel that education or fines or whatever we feel that we can do to educate our members to do better is enough. Because I think a lot of, unfortunately there are many who don't feel personally vindicated with a finding of wrongdoing. Are there any other questions? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, so here goes that. When would you perform the decision becomes final after 20 days? Mm -hmm. Yes. Why not immediately? <coughs> does, they make, does the arbitration panel make the decision right then? Yes, the arbitration panel makes the decision. And like I said, the great thing about arbitration is that we don't have a finding of the <coughs> usually same day, if we're lucky if we're here at the office, mm -hmm. or you know, the next day if we have to travel, we send out the arbitration decision. And it's, to, it's um, they have 20 days to appeal because they could say that they need time to put together their appeal because there was a procedural issue with the hearing. So even though they can't appeal because they're unhappy with the decision, if our panel did not allow them to present their case, did not allow them to cross-examine the other party, that's a procedural issue that they have a right to appeal. So it doesn't get, it doesn't become final until their 20-day period has passed. 
we can't finalize the data and send it out. Because I think we have to be on for four minutes. <laughs> I think we have to be on for four minutes. So Anything? part of that is you want to fill out your evaluation. Oh, yeah. oh well, okay. so this is Lily. So as I introduced earlier, Lily McLean is our new primary professional standards administrator. That information for me below is not correct, so just ignore it. That's not how you reach me at all. <laughs> I have um, that information in my phone. Yeah, exactly. No, that is exactly what it is. <laughs> that is exactly what it is. <laughs> Pretend it's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Lily is very well versed. She has she went to the administrator training. She can answer most of these questions. Um, I will still be um, the backup administrator to her and we'll be kind of kept up to date. I will hopefully be doing more of these trainings. If you ever need to reach us, if you have a question, if someone in your office receives a complaint, wants to file a complaint, you know, we're, like I said, we're not here to take your side. We're not here to play favorites or advocate on one, for one side or the other, but we can provide you with the information on how you want to proceed. That is awesome. <laughs> um, Thank you guys. I know that some of you guys have this almost every year. It's not exactly the most exciting information from one before in the afternoon. But I appreciate you guys all taking the training. I appreciate that you guys all volunteer for this. Um, without you guys volunteering um, to be part of this process, I mean, it would just be such a struggle to put together panels. So I love that everyone across the state is participating, that they are together and willing to be here. And it makes our job a lot easier as well. Curious, what's the number of participation of everyone now, all the boards, in statewide? Um, so in statewide professional standards, mm -hmm. like I said, um, on our earlier slide, we have a minimum of one students panel to two professional standards panels per, per board, but no max cap. So I think we have about 150 across the state um, students panelists who could be, you know, who could participate and available. Not everyone has taken the training. Some of you guys are taking it for the first time today. Some of you guys, some people it's hard, you know. We have the training one day. They, they have business to attend to today. The training is going to go up online um, for them to watch. Um, and once they do that, then, you know, we'll start to reach out to you to um, serve. And then for hearing panels, we have probably about maybe around 300, maybe a little bit less than that now, maybe 280 or so um, volunteers across the state. So, like I said, we should never, we should never have an issue with an impartial panel because we can pull, I mean, if, if I really needed to, I'm sure I could pull people from here to talk with Savannah and a pinch. I've had people travel from here to South Florida because they needed someone, you know, from outside the area. So it, it can do it. Are all associations now participating in the statewide? Uh, so for statewide, the only holdout we have is the Greater Augusta Association of Realtors. Um, Central Georgia did join us earlier, um, I would say this year, but not this year, in um, the end of 2019. Um, but this is a local board, you know, responsibility and privilege in um, Greater Augusta um, is doing nothing wrong by continuing to, you know, keep it local, and that is their prerogative. And any local board that would like to kind of take that back in house is welcome to do so as well. Because we don't, you know, we're not going to hide back and hold hostage this <laughs> process by any means. But we are here to make your AEs and your um, local board staff's lives as easy as possible. How many times would you say last year the grievance committee met? Last time, last Just year, average. I mean. I mean, last year they probably met. I wouldn't say quite twice a month, but then we had a couple of extra meetings thrown in. So I would say probably 22 to 24 times. So on average, two times a month. There were some months where there were any um, where we've had a few grievance panels that were canceled because we actually had no complaints. But then we also had a couple that we had to add in last minute because the sheer volume was too high for one panel. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.